governor of California, who's going to take it back, Tim Donnelly. Thank you. What an honor it is to be here tonight. What a great crowd. You guys need to give yourselves a hand. There's a lot of places that each of us could be tonight, but you chose to be here defending freedom so that we'll have a birthright to hand down to the next generation. You know, tonight my son is being honored for being on a baseball team. And I was outside feeling a little bit sad that I wasn't there. Well, a lot sad. And then my wife just miraculously texted me a picture of him up there with his buddies. And, you know, there's just something about that. There's something about this time that we're living in and understanding what you're fighting for. And I'm fighting for them. I'm fighting for my boys and my grandson to have the same opportunities we did. You know, I came to this state when I was 19 years old. And yeah, I had a whole lot more of this. <laughs> I'll never forget the day that I left Michigan. I'm the third oldest of 14 kids. We lived in a four bedroom, 1.5 bathroom home. And yeah, that 0.5 was real important in the morning, let me tell you. About half my family helped me push start my VW bug. And I turned to wave goodbye to them, but they were inside fighting over my room. <laughs> but my dad chased me about halfway down the street and he gave me two dollars and quarters wrapped in aluminum foil and he said son whatever you do don't call home <laughs> he said get yourself a coke somewhere between here and california you know i should have been nervous i should have been scared but i knew where i was going i was going to the land of opportunity i was going to california and I drove through a lot of nice states. I even went through Texas. <clears throat> Didn't much feel like staying. When I got into California, when I crossed that border, when I got down to the beach, saw my first California sunset, I felt love. I knew I was home. You know, the only limitation on my dreams was what I could imagine, how hard I was willing to work. Within a decade, I had met and married the most amazing woman in the state of California, and between the two of us, because she was a widow with two boys, and we added three to that, and so we have five sons. And we started a business. So, here I was, living the California dream, running my own business. I was in plastics, in manufacturing. Remember that movie, The Graduate? And then along came the government. We all know this story. They regulated me out of business and drove my customers out of the state. So many of my customers had left the state that year after year after year, for almost five straight years, I was losing half my customer base. You can't sustain a business that way. And then when I tried to win new customers, well, it turned out that the place that my customers had wound up is where my competitors moved and set up shops. So now they were benefiting from no regulations and very low wages in China. And they could literally ship parts back here at less than what I could pay for them from my wholesale supplier. You know, we can't run a business, we can't run a, an economy on just entertainment and service industry. Because all you're doing then is just trading money. We need to take things out of the ground. We need to, to take raw materials and we need to turn them into something of value. Amen. That's how you build a strong economy. You know, right now, the greatest threat to our freedom and to our future is the government.
And I don't need that poll, and you probably didn't either, where 72% of Americans said they finally figured out it's not big labor and it's not big business, it's big government. I mean, when your government is the fastest growing industry in your state, now that's unsustainable. Because they've got to pick your pocket to do it. And they've got to deprive more and more and more of us of our liberty and our opportunity in order to grow the government. And, and they have, we have a governor right now who just can't say no. He signed 805 new restrictions on our freedom, on our businesses, and our constitutional civil rights. Oh, and by the way, he just announced today that he is running for re-election. So I thought I was just going to walk into the governor's mansion, but I guess I have an opponent. You know what I say? Bring it up. And they said he's only raised $18 million. Well, he better raise a whole lot more with what he's selling. Because he's selling socialism, and he's selling tyranny. And he wants to confiscate more and more and more of your earnings and your wealth in order to redistribute it in exchange for votes. It's that simple. You know what? A lot of people are starting to get that. You know, I want to say something. A lot of people say, well, how in the world are you going to win as a Republican? Well, I'm not running to win as a Republican. I'm running as an American. You know, I heard the chairman of the Republican Party in California say Democrats are the enemy. He said it at a group where he thought that would be popular, and they gasped, and I cringed. Democrats aren't the enemy. Tyranny is the enemy of freedom. And tyranny is running amok in the state of California. And you know it on the federal level. All I have to say to you is NSA, IRS, EPA. And the EPA has more control over our natural resources in the state of California than we do. With a new governor, that could change. Because when they come here and say they want to tear down, I'm going to say, you will not tear down this dam. You know, we are suffering from one of the worst droughts that the West has ever seen. But it was a government-created drought long before it stopped raining. And what's lacking is not just rainfall, but vision. We need a statewide water plan that respects every region. It's not rocket science. I think we need to terminate the high-speed rail. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow I think you guys would favor my plan for the high speed. <laughs> As governor, I would be able to appoint five of the nine people on that board. And I would send them there with a mission to take $500 out of the $10 billion and spend it on bumper stickers that say high speed rail, slap it on every Southwest airliner in the state of California and declare mission accomplished. Yeah. You can clap. <laughs> But we ought, to take, we ought to go back to the people and say, let's build real infrastructure, the infrastructure we need. And, and it starts with storage. So that way when it does rain, we can capture that water that is falling and, and control it and keep it. If you capture the rain during the good years, then you'll have it during the bad ones. And in order to control our destiny, we have to control the water. You know, the state has turn some of the, the, the rural counties into, into welfare counties because they're literally keeping people from being able to make a living off the land because they want to control where we live. You guys all know this. You've seen it. Well, it's just un-American. It's just when the government has more control over you and more control over your property and your business than you do, Something's wrong. That's not, that's not the country that I was born in. 
I want my country back. I want my freedom back. And you know what? We can do this. We're Americans. We're not just Americans, we're Californians. You know, it's funny. You see the, uh, I believe it's the French are doing desalinization. The Israelis are doing desalinization. Somehow California is sitting next to a massive ocean and we haven't figured out how to desalinate cheap enough. I think we can do that. And as a matter of fact, if, they, if the French can do it, we can do it a whole lot better. Come on. Every U.S. Navy ship does it. There you go. Well, for some reason, we've allowed them to divide us regionally. And I think this drought is going to have an opposite effect. I think it's going to unite Californians in what we can do. Because we're tired of hearing politicians tell us that you just can't do that here. I'm sorry. I want to tell the politicians who say you just can't do that here to go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to, to, to deal with this drought, we need to increase storage in all the dams we have. We need to build a whole lot more dams. And we need to build dams in Southern California. And you know what? We need to do something about that Delta smell. I've heard proposals about grinding it up and pouring it out on the field as fertilizer. But you know what? We shouldn't blame that poor little fish. Because the reality is, it is the people in the federal government that want to have more control mm -hmm. over our destiny here in California than we do. And that's unconstitutional. We have a Tenth Amendment for a reason. And we need to have a governor who will stand up and, and, and say, you know what? I'm sorry. If four buckets of minnows are going to die so that people can eat, well, that's a good trade-off. <laughs> floor of the California State Assembly today, that Sacramento needs to stop dumping their untreated sewage and affluent into the Delta, because that's creating so much ammonia, it kills off the plankton, and that's what the Delta smelt eats. So if they were really worried about it as an endangered species, but they're not, they just don't want people living on the world. And, they, and, and, and we all know that if you don't if we don't control our own food supply, you don't have any security. Because last time I checked, you can live without a necktie, and most of you have successfully done that here tonight. <laughs> I know, I'm probably the only one, but I just came from Sacramento. Most of us can live without a wristwatch these days, and a handful of us can live without our iPhones for two or three hours at a time. <laughs> but you can't live without food, and you can't live without water. So that is the number one issue, and the number one industry in the state of California, and we need to protect it. We need to let that water flow and get the people back to work. Because the bottom line is, when people work, that brings pride. We need to bring pride back to California. You know what? I think we ought to frack our way to prosperity and drill our way to prosperity. <laughs> Rather than sitting on an ocean of oil and importing it from our enemies. You know, I want to have the same problems they're having there in North Dakota. Instead of having a government come in and mandate a $10 an hour minimum wage to put a, a floor under the economy. Wouldn't it be nice? Back over there, they're paying them 20 bucks an hour plus a signing bonus to work at McDonald's. They've got a labor shortage and they've got an economic boom the likes of which we haven't seen since the gold rush. You know, if we could just tap 15% of the Monterey share, USC has done a study and said it will create up to 3 million jobs over five years. 
and 25 to 30 billion dollars in additional revenues. Can you imagine the tsunami of U-Hauls lined up on the 10 freeway coming back here from Texas and Arizona and Nevada to create jobs and start businesses? Wouldn't that be a good immigration problem? <laughs> well, you all know that California is dead last in everything we ought to be first in. We're dead last in business friendliness. We're not just dead last in one survey or two surveys or three surveys. We are 50th out of all 50 states. Now, I know some people might argue there are 58 states or 57 <laughs> states. There are 58 counties, and some of our counties are as populated as, as some countries. But we are dead last. When you talk to business owners, they tell you, I'm tired of being hassled and harassed by the government. Every time I turn around, there's some government entity that is making it impossible to do something that five years ago I could do easily. Mm -hmm. Now I was in one guy's business, he's a, he's a manufacturer. And he was showing me all of his equipment and he was so proud of it. I love manufacturing. I love seeing where things are made. I think we ought to get back to making things, but the problem is that we've got to get the dad dumb government out of the way. But as he showed me this one machine, this laser, he said, he said, I've owned this for six years. He said, when the local air board, the AQMD, comes in here to regulate me, they come, they walk right past this equip piece of equipment for six years to go survey how much paint thinner I had. They actually had a guy whose job was to do that. He said they didn't bother with the acetone that was much more volatile and dangerous. They went to the paint thinner. And they never even looked at this machine, but now it's on the radar screen. They decided that I can no longer operate this laser without a permit from them. It's only going to cost me $3,500 a year. You know what they're really doing? They're just creating a job for the paperwork. <coughs> it's literally that simple. There is no danger from his piece of equipment. He's been operating it safely. He bought it legally. This is an unconstitutional taking, and he is being deprived of the ability to make a living by the government that swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. And you know, when you see that, it's hard to not get too angry. You know, we have to harness that. We have to control that. And then we have to direct it. And we have to go out there. And we have to show the world that the United States is not finished. Can you imagine what would happen if a little revolution started in California? <laughs> Can you imagine the shock waves that would be spread across this country? Talk about an earthquake. <laughs> Talk about a tsunami. Because nobody expects it. They're all saying we can't win. Mm -hmm. You know what? When people tell me something's impossible, and then they tell me exactly how I can't do it, why I can't do it, I make that my to-do list. That's how I got elected the first time. And I did it by walking door to door and wearing out shoe leather. And I intend to wear out boot leather now because I don't wear shoes anymore. <coughs> but these boots were made for walking. <laughs> the thing is, I can't do it alone. I'm going to need your help. And usually at this point in the speech, a candidate will reach in his pocket and pull out an envelope and ask you for money. But I forgot to put one in my pocket. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. Mark's going to bring me one of these envelopes, and then he's going to make it available for you. Here's the thing. Elections are not won just with money. Money is important, and we need it. And everybody can do something. So if you can write a check here tonight, we will put that money to use, let me tell you. 
We have an army spread across this state. So we're going to buy a whole lot of cheeseburgers and fuel for the bus and printed materials for you and everyone else who decides they want to help to hand out door to door along with yard signs and everything else. And I've been raising money and I've been working hard at it. And let me tell you, I found some very unusual partners for us. But I need all hands on deck. So if all you can give is even $5, that's fine. But I want you to put your name on it. I want to be connected to you. I want you to be able to get our emails so that you can share them. Because the second most important thing you can do is spread the word. A group this size can win this county. here you'll note that it has an option for you to sign up for what you want to do to help. If you want to make phone calls or walk your neighborhood or take over your neighborhood or get involved in some way. If you know somebody who can write a bigger check than you can, introduce me to them. Give me their phone number. I will pick up the phone and call them and I'm not shy about asking for money. The whole way here in the car I was asking people for $5,000 out a clip and you know what? Almost every one of them said yes. We are just about to do a big order of yard signs, and we're gonna. We're, that's why I'm calling and asking these people. I'm asking them to sponsor the materials for different counties, and then they get their name attached to it. So if you know of anybody that might want to sponsor this county, okay. let me know. But regardless of that, we will have those materials soon, and we will get them out to you. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Curtis. I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer uh, in the semiconductor industry. The last company I worked for was a JDS unit base in Santa Clara. And um, I'm excited when you say we've got to get jobs back in California. But the other thing that I'm concerned about, and you know about it probably already too, is, is the jobs of, of high tech are typically being filled by uh, people from other countries. And these are very nice people. I work with them, PhDs. They've got uh, PhD degrees from the University of Peking or you know that kind of thing and that doesn't make them bad people but unfortunately they're displacing engineers that are Americans and there are a lot of them so I would like you to consider that when you become governor that we have to get that under control we have to you know I we have to take care of Americans make sure they get jobs if there are jobs that are not being, uh, or no, nobody wants to, to uh, fill, or, then bring them in. I haven't got a problem with that, but we've got too many Americans that are, especially uh, kids that are coming back from Iraq and from Afghanistan that are homeless right now. They need jobs. So let's start thinking about those kind of things. Thank you. Thank you. And I've been one of the staunchest supporters of E-Verify in requiring that we not be handing out jobs to people in the country illegally when we have so many people that are out of work. And you know, when you mention our veterans, it breaks my heart to see that we're willing to bankrupt our cities and break our state over promises made to public sector unions when we won't keep our word to those who are risking their lives that we might be free. And they come back here and they can't even get their benefits and they can't even be treated in a decent manner when they need health care. We can't figure out how to take care of them. And until we do that, and I'll tell you what, on my watch, that is going to be one of the top priorities. The other thing we need to do is we need to take California from the bottom three in education to the top. And it ain't going to start. We need common sense reform, not common core. Do you guys have any other questions?
Yes, sir. Our state has a balanced program. Our current governor has used every trick in the book to make it look like we have a balanced budget. Yeah. He started by finding $6.6 .6 billion the first year in additional revenue that didn't materialize as the year went on. The second year, he changed the tax withholding uh, tables so that he withheld more from the wage earners during the year had to pay it back the next April. Though. Third year and this year, he's selling car credits. What is your plan to have a true balanced budget? My plan is real simple. It's to not spend more than we actually take in. <laughs> and right now, you're correct. They use gimmicks all day long. As a matter of fact, we are $13 billion in arrears to the federal government for EDD. But what they're doing is they're sticking every business owner with that repayment. And it's on their, it's on their, uh, their little remittance form that they have to pay in. So they're having to retire that debt that actually belongs to the state. And that is unconscionable, it's criminal. And the bottom line is that before we got almost half the country dependent on the government, we figured out a way to survive without so much government. And I come from a family of 14 kids, and my mother used to say, if I didn't have so much help, I wouldn't need so much help. <laughs> well, I think we need to identify exactly what government should do. Well, we certainly don't need a high-speed rail. I know that's what he wants his legacy to be. But he wants to do it with money we don't have, and he wants to steal people's land and businesses to do it. Well, we, so we terminate that, but then we do need to take care of the highways and the bridges and the infrastructure, and we need real infrastructure. But most importantly, and the single best thing we could do is to create a climate of certainty for business owners and every single citizen, so that at the beginning of the year, they know what they're gonna be taxed, and they know that by the end of the year, that's not gonna change and become retroactive where the government can literally put a gun to your head and say, hey, I'm stealing more of your money, even though I lied to you about what you were gonna owe at the beginning of the year, and that's what that was. That's what Prop 30 was. And it was sold down through our schools. But you know, as governor, I will declare a moratorium on all new restrictions on your freedom, on your businesses, and your constitutional civil rights. I will use, use the same bully pulpit he used to raise our taxes to lower them. And what I will foster is a business climate where people are welcome and where business will grow and flourish. And in our state, where 50% of our revenues come from personal income tax, that means people working. That's one of the single most important things you can do to help the top line. But the bottom line is what you spend. And the bottom line is where they always struggle because they don't know how to say no. I don't have a problem with that. I grew up with next to nothing with 14 brothers and sisters, and I'll tell you what. We'll figure out a way to do without all these programs. And there's a whole lot of people. We have more people dependent on welfare and government assistance in the state of California than any other state two and a half times the national average. And yet we still have one out of every four Californians living below the poverty line. Well, that's an epic fail. And, and you know what we need? We need to start helping each other. Remember when you helped your neighbor instead of the government helping your neighbor? Remember when the church took care of widows and orphans and it wasn't the government's responsibility to steal from your pocket and then force you to contribute? And now, they're involved in so many different things that don't make any sense. I mean, if you have a kid in public school today, you're probably upset to hear that the uh, so-called bathroom bill is not going to be repealed and is not going to be on the, on the ballot 
in spite of all the signatures we got. You know what? That isn't what government's supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be teaching our kids. They're supposed to be public education, not in government indoctrination centers where they're doing social experiments. Right. And the bottom line is, I think enough of us in 2014 are ready for a change. Yes. So I want to tell you right now that I am working six days a week, 20 hours a day, I am living on the road in a plane, train, bus, and automobile. And everywhere I go, there are people who feel the way you do. And you know what? They're not all in the same party. But they're all Americans. And we could unite a divided majority on American values, hard work, personal responsibility, and above all, freedom. And we can win in November. God bless you and Godspeed. Oh.